What's going on there, Golden Bear family? I hope you're well and doing fine. Let's go ahead and kick this off in module 6.3 and 6.4. And uh, with that, there's a great quote here from Henry Grady that kind of comments on what are the problems going on in the South and why can't they seem to ever rebound since the end of the Civil War? And listen to this quote. The South didn't furnish a thing on earth for that funeral, but the corpse and the hole in the ground. They buried him in a New York coast and um, coat, it should say, and a Boston pair of shoes and a pair of breeches from Chicago and a short shorts from Cincinnati, leaving him nothing to carry into the next world with him to remind him of the country in which he lived. A rather scathing indictment, but it was written in such a way to remind those in the North that maybe the investment in the South certainly has been amiss. Those who are going to be taking the Steger Cent uh, Select with me will be talking more about this document here to kind of keep track as to uh, how have the civil rights of African Americans post-Civil War been infringed and uh, taken from them despite the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments. Some targets for today is we're going to talk about the economy in the South and how the lives of African Americans both remain the same and if there were any changes present. And as usual, I'm going to start with the story. Uh, my mother grew up uh, and was born in a town called Newton, just right outside of the of, of uh, Harvard, which is in Boston. And she would spend many a days walking around the campus, etc. Her family must have come from some money uh, because they had a house out in Situate, which was out on the coast, where she would go spend the summer months. And at the age of nine, she found herself moving out to uh, California with her mother and father. But we, growing up in our home, we had everything was Boston. I had to be a Boston Red Sox fan. I had to be a New England Patriots fan. In fact, if we wanted to eat regularly, we had to comment as to who we were loyal to during those times. Sadly, uh, both teams seemed to kind of stink during the years in which I was in my formative stages. And it wasn't until, you know, the past, you know, 10 to 12 years did the Patriots uh, football team ever become a worthwhile name. And, and so now people just accuse me of being a poser when all I have to say is, no, I've been a fan for a long time. For various various reasons and I've had an opportunity of going a few times to Boston and it was there uh, that when I went when I was young all I can remember is downtown Boston is kind of dirty and grimy and you know maybe a few aspects of the, the, the they call it the walk of freedom that you can go on that is a brick inlay that takes you through different aspects which was kind of you know as a young kid it didn't seem a big deal all I remember is this cool little lake that had swans on them uh, next to the church where my mom said she used to go with her family in downtown Boston, a congregationalist type of church. Well, when I went there as an adult, um, it looked vastly different. There were entire sections of this upper raised double level freeway, I think called I-93, that was ripped out. You can hear nothing but riveting and pounding and things being removed. And I asked my friend, I'm like, who lived there, I go, well, what's going on? He goes, oh, this is called the Big Dig. I go, what do you mean the big dig? He goes, well, essentially, we're eliminating all of these ugly infrastructures of freeway and we're burying them. I'm like, well, what do you mean burying? Well, we want to put them beneath ground and we're trying to create new arteries to Logan Airport and other aspects to, uh, to make freeways flow faster. And I go, oh, okay. I go, what do you call it? He goes, it's called the big dig. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, it started in 1982 at the tune of $2.8 billion. It was the largest expense and largest infrastructure build at the time of in, in 1982. And he says, by the time it was finished in 2007, seriously, 1982 to 2007, it had cost overruns of over 120,000 190%. In fact, the bill went from $2.8 billion to over $22 billion of cost overruns, etc. Was this a big dig that brought about clarity of life and, and reduced traffic, or was it just a big headache and the big headache, so to speak? So, were they sold a bill of goods, uh, or has it turned out to be a big saving grace for the downtown center of Boston? Um, that will come back kind of at the end of this. Uh, lecture of sorts. Well, in the South, um, at, we, you know, we'll be talking about the North and their industrial power and might in subsequent um, lectures. But for right now, we're just going to be focusing on the South and and how did the South 
um, at the end of 1877 when the northerners just finally says fine the reconstruction is over uh, we're gonna allow the south to determine how they want what they want when they want um, what is this going to take place and so yes the railroads did begin moving south yes there was some mill towns that began forming around the cotton industries there to begin creating um textiles like of making clothes etc where still to this day if you go to north carolina and south carolina that is where most of our carpets are made and and uh, tapestries for our window coverings etc um but for the most part uh th there was very little major industry going on in the south that would have reason to keep people there and flourishing there um, many of them faced incredible hardships that were were in place many african americans continued experiencing the racism the prejudice that was there prior and essentially it did not take effect like it might have been up in the north this is something that i'll review with my steger select in addition to this we see many um african americans relegated to jobs that would be service type of industries however there were some that were able to go off to various universities one of them namely being howard university where they could be trained and equipped but often because of prejudice and racial divides that existed in the south um, and in, in the north we don't want to lose sight of this racism that was still prevalent in, in the north many of these african-american uh, equipped and trained uh, professionals were only able to provide services for those of their own race so it was a very challenging situation for those in the south um, where they were sold a bill of goods at the end of the world at the end of civil war but by the time we're looking at 1877 and the 1880s uh they're like yeah we have some that have gone off to college some that have man managed to escape plantation life but for the bulk of them the majority of them very very little change was prevalent here is a picture that I uh, like to kind of discuss. I will do more of this at the Steger Select, but here you need to recognize that very few pockets of industry. And so you can see the, the, the cross-haired lines there. That's the textile industries that are forming um, in that area. But for the most part, we have agricultural based. Um, and this agricultural base is going to um, really catapult the South into, at this point, I believe, are producing 60% of the world's uh, cotton and um, textile industries. I mean, the closest country to uh, the South is that of India, producing, if my memory serves, around 16% at that time. And, and so, is the agricultural idea what was going to help America grow and continue to become expansive in their power? Well, yes, on many fronts. It's what they produced in the South, along with the food and other foodstuffs, that did fuel um, our gross domestic product, but it did not rival by any measure of the means what was taking place in the North with the industrialization going on. And in fact, uh, when I talk about this in a few more lectures, uh, you'll see the purple pockets there on your screen. That is where coal is found. It could have been very, very easy in West Virginia and others to build a railroad down along that on the eastern, on the western slope of the Appalachian Mountains. Yes, it's Appalachia, not Appalachia, like we would say in California, Appalachia. Um, the Appalachian Mountains and the Appalachian people, um, that, that railroad could have come down there very easily and been used to build the, the, the steel factories there. Well, what happened? No, Carnegie and the steel barons, there's 40 of them there in Pittsburgh alone, uh, said, no, let's not do that. We kind of like it here in Pittsburgh because we want jobs for our people and those in the north. So very interesting uh, capacity of what could have been, but was not made available for decisions made by the power barons, namely Carnegie and his cronies up there. Um, in the south, um, you can recognize that it remained many of the similar patterns, culturally speaking, of this peculiar institution. Remember the Redeemers in the last time period that we talked, I mean, the last lecture that we talked about that really didn't want change. They wanted to go back to this um, antebellum, if you will, remember what it was like before the Civil War. And, and so it was a very difficult situation to bring about change. Um, this institutional idea that they're just poor country farmers, that nobody wanted to come south to invest in there and create new businesses, kind of created a legacy where the south just had to fend for themselves. 
And what did they fend for themselves? Well, they created, um, namely, a new industry, tobacco, or reintroduced an industry of tobacco that was brought out, uh, if you remember, way back in our first colony of in, in 1607, where tobacco was placed there. But you can see tobacco in, in the orange colored areas there really became a unique industry in that it was controlled by a few families, namely one of them being Duke, um, which then goes on to start the Duke University for some of you who would just only dream to get into that school because of its uh, uh, competitive nature and challenge. But um, it, this mechanization and rolling of the cigarettes, if you need to be mindful of, is, is a really huge windfall of business to people in the area. However, it is still agrarian based and it's not create the uh, money uh, that people can make on a day-to-day -day basis that they might be experiencing there in the North. Please, let's not forget about how the Jim Crow laws and what that meant. Jim Crow was not a type of person. It was not a bird. It was just what they referred to the South and still what we refer to the South when civil rights laws are not respected. And uh, these civil rights laws, although passed by our government in 1887, were struck down by various laws of the Taney courts that I've talked about in prior lectures. Of, of where they uh, basically disembowel, take apart the Civil Rights Act in giving the protections of the African Americans. And what does this allow them to do? It allows the local state uh, counties and the state governments to begin passing poll taxes, literacy taxes, grandfather clauses that keeps the poor whites and the African Americans from having opportunities from voting. A sad day and a sad situation that is going on in the South during this time and continues in the South until we get to the, the 1960s and 1970s when many of those changes are come about uh, from that. Here's an example of how um, the white elitist um, plantation farmers, if you will, had an opportunity of how they forced the political spectrum to lean in their um, their they're tied, so to speak. And so by passing legislation, put, forcing people to have to take literacy tests or forcing people to pay a tax before they take it, basically assured them of keep voting whiter and whiter and whiter and more conservative and conservative and conservative and more racist, racist, racist people into the political spectrum in the South um, in, in, during this time. And so you can see by 1900 here that Look at that band of that of that of that angled. Uh, I don't know what you call it. Um, yeah, just band of colors here, of of people who are not even able to vote and express their wishes and interests in the political system. So not a good time for American history during this time. And so this is what reminds me of the Big Dig. To conclude, the Big Dig promised a whole lot. It promised to take 23 lanes of traffic. And, and three major freeways and put them down into basically five levels up and down of 23 lanes converging into five, essentially. Brilliant and amazing thing, but if it took over 30 years and a cost overrun of 190%, doesn't that sound more like a lemon rather than an apple? Doesn't that sound like a bill of sales that did not measure up? Um, at the end of the Civil War, um, it looked hopeful with the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments. But by the time we get to the end of this time period of 1898, we see court cases such as the Plessy versus Ferguson ruling allowing the separate but equal idea to emerge into the landscape of America and treating African-American people and those who are disenfranchised in a poor way. Well, um, in this class, I'm going to be talking uh, about this separately because it's going to be part of your final exam. So we'll fast forward through this type of thing as we move forward. So on to our next topic, and that is America industrializes and what takes place in the um, major cities. So um, with that, there's another great, 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 I'm talking like Elma Ford here, but there's another great uh, quote here called by Henry George. Um, here he says the, the wealthy class is becoming more wealthy, but the, the lower class, um, he called them uh, the poorer class, okay? The lower class is becoming more dependent. The gulf between the employed and the employer is growing wider. The social contrasts are becoming sharper. And as horse carriages appear, so do barefoot children. 
You say horse carriages. Well, yeah, that was the latest and up-and-coming transportation mode. Uh, this, in 1879, could have been said in 1979 with the disparities going on, in 2007 with the disparities going on, uh, in 2017 with the disparities going on. And so this uh, struggle seems to continue within the capitalistic model. Please don't share with others or tell others that I'm anti-capitalist and I'm all this. No, I'm just here to share with you that uh, if not kept in balance and in check, by the government and capitalism kind of working together. Um, you are going to have situations where you're going to have children without feet, uh, not feet, without shoes, or, or um, lifestyles that are completely uh, far different than an opposing neighbors uh, during that time period. So let us march in. Yes, for this class, uh, you're going to be needing to do this cause and effect. Please pay attention. There are two questions at the bottom of that that you're going to want to be looking at. And so you might want to print this out as I go through the lecture so you can perhaps consider seeing how did in, this, in these growing industries change um, both positive and negative uh, to the lives of those, uh, whether you're immigrants or whether you're the wealthy, wealthy elite that we see emerge during this time. Well, we're going to be talking about how the industrialization emerged on America, how it created America to become a world power during this time, or on the cusp of becoming a world power, I should say, by uh, uh, 1898. Um, and then how these changes affected everyday life for people. But before I want to tell you a little story, okay? It's called Donato Can. Si se puede, Donato. Si se puede. Um, many of you know, uh, or maybe not know, that I, I lived in Mexico with my family for 12 years, and it is there I met so many wonderful people. Um, just a few bad, I'm talking two or three bad apples, and out of that, thousands of people I met that were fantastic and incredible, incredible people. One of them is Donato and his wife, Maggie. Maggie comes from a family of 22, yo. 22. There were 23 and one passed away when he was six or so years old. Can you imagine that poor mother? And then Donato came from a family of just 11, just a meager 11. They grew up in this high, high part of Durango and he was actually of an indigenous people group. He was a Cora uh, tribe member and they were known as the fierce fighters that even up until the mid 1970s and stuff, um, there were gringos that were forbade from going into those regions and even Mexican nationals, uh, they had a double mistrust. So people would you know, be there on their horses. They were known to carry their pistols and everything else. And it was a really um, still seen as a first warrior type of class of people group, the, 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 the Coral Indian native people groups. Well, I met Donato about year three of, of living in Mexico and I met him at a Christmas festival where we were invited over to somebody, some people's homes and we shared dinner and pozole and had good laughter and this guy seemed really cool and chill and, and pretty soon I, 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 I heard that he, he builds something. So I said, hey Donato, how would you like to come over and build a deck for us? And so he came over and built a deck and next thing you know, he, uh, over the years, we built a great friendship and a great relationship and um, traveled places together and did all sorts of neat things as, as a family. But uh, a couple, about a year two after doing work for me, I started asking me a little more complex things. And hey, can you fix this on the car? Do you know how to do that here? Do you know electrical? Every time he said, yeah, I can do that type of thing. Um, one night we were sitting there, it was, uh, it was Mexico's Independence Day and we were celebrating out on the porch and we were going to light fireworks at night and yada, da 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 and, and he begins pointing out to me different constellations up on the sky and, and telling me different stories and I'm just sitting here amazed because one thing that Donato's person, if there is ever a zombie apocalypse, I'm going to go make sure I'm with Donato. The homeboy can do and fix anything and I'm sure growing up with no one, his way around weapons, he could shoot off a few things with whatever necessary to protect us with. But what is even more intriguing, this guy knew about the stars, he knew about so much, an incredible voracious amount of knowledge, but he didn't know how to read or write. When I I made it a policy, every time we would do work and have to buy things, I have to pay uh, employees, you know, including him, every week I'd pay him, I would always have him sign his signature and his signature was simply an X. And it was a jo running joke, but I kept these things so that way his wife or others could say Douglas never paid for these things and everybody knew that was the Nato signature and X. 
I say this with you is that there were countless things across the landscape of America that were changing. And in fact, at the end of 1865 to, 19, to 1889, America goes on a 25 year growth spurt that no other country can rival. I mean, it is very similar to what we're happening now with the advent of the, of, of, of the internet in the 1990s and how fast in the past 20 years that has transformed and revolutionized us and the world for sure. It has certainly flattened it, I'd like to say. But Donato, um, I think, is a great illustration point as to how immigrant type of people that might not know how to read and write built America. And there's going to be stories of Carnegie who came from a meager life as from Scotland and built up this amazing force to where he actually sold a business. I don't know if I'm stealing too much from my future lecture, but he stole his car, his steel business uh, to another banker named as JP Morgan for $400 million. Uh, that's a lot of money now. Um, back then uh, was an incredible amount of money. And then what did JP Morgan do? He went on to take his steel company and made it into the first billion dollar company. It became US Steel. That was the largest steel producer. 95% of the world's steel had to come from him and through his corporation. So these were all men um, that came from meager experiences and backgrounds. I'm not saying they don't didn't know how to read and write, but they use their collective knowledge to make America um, incredibly industrialized and strong. So moving on with that, um, the new industry, you need to recognize that post Civil War, as I just alluded to, um, America grows and to become um, a political power. How does this do? It happens because the Carnegie's of their time, the Rockefeller's of their time, the JP Morgan's of their time, the Leland Stanford's of their time, um, um, take on new business practices and um, business practices that are respected by the government, meaning the government and their laissez-fairness are saying, you guys just do whatever you need to do in order to keep the country growing. Why? We need our immigrants with jobs. As long as they have full bellies, they're happy. Um, politicians are happy when people are paying their taxes. You, you get the picture here. As long as there are jobs, things just seem to run well. And America um, labeled these soon to be very wealthy um, owners of industry as titans or as robber barons. And so I'm gonna try and talk a little bit about those as we go forward, um, But uh, and I'll talk really in depth about them with the Steger Select, but you need to recognize that um, if you see them as saints or if you see them as sinners, um, what their practices did is quadruple America's gross domestic product. I mean, China in the 19, in 2010s, which was experiencing the greatest growth um, on the global scale, they were happy if they got a 7% growth, okay? To quadruple the growth, that is an amazing feat. How is this growth happening? Here you can see an imagery of um, the railroads and how they've expanded post the Civil War from 1870 being about 50,000 miles of track. By the time of 1900, we see close to 200,000 miles of track. The closest um, nation that had, a, it was about 22,000 feet of track and that was there of England. Combined collectively across the globe, America had over 77% of the railroad tracks uh, placed uh, that, that made us perfectly suited not only to expand markets from east to west, okay, in America, going out from, you know, New York to California, but it allows us to get goods made in the south, goods made on the west, goods made in the east, to eventually be sold then also to there in Europe. So an incredible uh, specter of industry is taking place there in the north. So it is because of the railroad that, that this, uh, what do you call it, the iron horse, if you will, that transforms um, the American economic scale and it allows us to not only create new markets, but it also creates new markets just to meet the needs of the railroads where we need steel and coal and wood and glass and rubber and oil and kerosene and all these things. This creates new markets, okay? Uh, and, and it also leads to new technologies. What's one new technology? Um, if you remember in yes, last time's lecture, I showed you a map of how all those railroads had expanded. Well, what if each railroad had its own gauge or its own width? often the case. 
So it's during this time that railroads came together and says, wait a minute, we can start linking our lines if we start putting in the same gauge of railroad. And then secondly, if we start communicating and so actually a new form of timing, standardized time zones were created so that way they can predict when and how things would arrive. Brilliant strategy and was one of the most um, innovative times um, in American history. You see the telegraph linking us to the Europe as well as to the West Coast. You see skyscrapers being able to be constructed so now more migrants, immigrants can move into the cities. A Bessemer process, you need to know the importance of that because if you don't know what the Bessemer process is, you don't understand how our initial stages of getting in the Industrial Revolution begin to occur. The Bessemer press process essentially was a stolen idea by Carnegie from England. However, there was a man named Mr. Kelly, I forget his name, Mr. Kelly, a Kenny, Mr. Kelly, who had made it in Kentucky. That was a tongue twister, Mr. Kelly of Kentucky. But where essentially the Bessemer process is added cold air to the, to the iron that was happening and it blew away the impurities. It really made it white hot. And what was the end result when it cooled off is a much stronger and not much lighter, but much stronger and more durable type of steel that can be used to make the rails that wouldn't split to begin making tubes and pipes and construction things to allow the high rises to go this way instead of being all wobbly and not able to withstand things. So the Bessemer process, without that, I argue, and many historians argue, there wouldn't have been the Industrial Revolution, Revolution that took place uh, along the American landscape. And because America controlled this Bessemer process, it enabled them to capture 95% of the world's need for steel. An incredible um, time for America. So here you see some men working in uh, making of these tubing processes, and I'll talk about that when I get to the Steger Select. Please recognize in your reading of how um, during this time there was a lot of money being made available, whether it be done by the barons themselves like Carnegie and Stanford and JP Morgan or even European investors, but people were investing in developing new technologies that did what? It transformed the lives of everyday people. And it enabled them to not only have things to do on the weekend, such as the motion picture, but enabled them to have lights or streets lit at night for safety. So that what that can mean is that maybe children and women can walk back and forth at night um, or people can work longer hours and feel a sense of the, So all these things help add to a complexity of America that was growing. Now, I'm gonna talk about a subject here that has shown up on the test almost every year. It's called vertical versus horizontal integration. And you gotta remember that capitalism is based on one thing, to create profit. And without profit, uh, you can't um, find ways to expand your business. And that is the tension point is because in often, often many times in early capitalistic cycles, the easiest way to create more profit was to pay your workers less. And that is going to become a problem for us as we unpack, you know, in future uh, chapters um, in dealing with unions and stuff. But for right now, I just want to focus on think of as a business person and what can you do to reduce costs so that way you can make greater profit. And in a real true con in a capitalistic system, with competition available, those lower costs should reflect in I and you paying less for those goods. Hence, can you imagine if there was only one burger joint in Temecula or Marietta? Um, it, the burgers might cost 16 or 17 dollars, but since there's so many of them competing, that lowers the price. And so. There are some evils to capitalism and there are some blessings to capitalism. But what our barons did, especially JP Morgan, Carnegie and Rockefeller did, was to create new strategies of how to optimize this capitalism. I think it's best shown in this visual. On the left hand side with vertical integration, this was done by Carnegie. Now here it's using cattle. But Carnegie did everything where he controlled, so we're looking from the bottom up on this cow. So if you wanna make money and a profit, you would be there that owns the cattle, 
the slaughterhouse, the railroad cars, the warehouses, the meat packings, the delivery wagons to eventually get it to the Ace Meat Industries where it is uh, packaged up and, and sent out to the various people that can buy it from them. That's called vertical integration. Um, that's exactly what Apple does in buying everything that they need to make all of their products. So just recently, they um, stopped buying their Intel um, chips that go in the CPU chips. They've been buying Intel chips for, I don't know, 16 or 17 years. They finally says, Fooey on you, we're just going to create our own company and buy our own way into that type of thing. We're going to control everything from A to Z. Okay, reference to Amazon too, controlling A to Z. So this is called vertical integration. And you didn't know the person's name that came up with this was Carnegie. Okay, I don't mean to go into detail as to how did Carnegie do it, but you need to know it starts in Minnesota, at the very bottom where coal is, and events eventually ends up into the lands of of Pittsburgh where they make it. Now on the right hand side is Rockefeller, Rocka Steeler, Rocka uh, uh, Crooked. Uh, Carnegie did not like Rockefeller because he felt his business practices were, although totally capitalistic, um, he felt that they did not respect the rights of the common worker. But here is this idea of horizontal integration. His big deal was oil. Rockefeller is oil, Carnegie is steel and coal. Okay, You need to know the two of them. Rockefeller quickly recognizes, well, not only do I want to own everything A to Z, I want to hide everything into one big corporation and I want to call it a trust. And so here you can see his competition. Let's say this is oil refinery A, B, C, and D. So we have, here's my mouse, A, B, C, and D. What he does is he places um, board members onto each one of them where these board members basically convince the owner of this one in Pennsylvania, this one in California, this one in Ohio, etc., to say, you know what, you're going to probably make more profit if you join the U.S. oil company. We call it Standard Oil, which it was called Standard Oil. And they're like, sure, fine. So they move all of their corporations into this trust called the U.S. Oil Company. And what does this do? It systematically enables Rockefeller to control 95% of all the oil refineries in all of America crazy this enables him to do a couple of things what it what it allows him to control gives him incredible leverage it makes him probably bigger not probably was bigger than the american government and what they had in their reserves etc okay it also gave him leverage of how to negotiate with other countries for the cost of things but in return it also created lower costs for the consumer and lower costs for um companies using uh, the oil and the kerosene, etc. So uh, there were some positives and negatives um, behind these types of things. So I'll talk about that in my Steger Select. So to push back against this, the government began recognizing that, oh my gosh, Rockefeller is getting too big. This guy is controlling too much of an industry. And I'm going to show you a little picture of him right now. Here's Rockefeller in his hand with Congress. Okay. And you can see him uh, in his hand with Congress over the bunch of oil barrels that lead to the back of, of the, you know, Washington, D.C. in the background with smokestacks coming behind it. Those are not smokestacks, but those are oil refineries from Cleveland to I forget what other refinery uh, regions that are, there are. So th this this idea can tells us is that Rockefeller is influencing Congress and he's encouraging them to just quit looking at the large corporations. We're not creating any problems. In fact, we're creating solutions. We're creating new jobs. We're creating new opportunities. We're creating new um, global business practices. And, and so just, just stay out of our business. Well, uh, the Congress doesn't like this too much and they begin passing a law. You'll need to know this. Please be aware of it. And its initial outrun uh, is only, uh, it doesn't work. It's called the Sherman Antitrust Act and it basically says, companies that are too big have to break up. Notice I didn't say co companies that are too mean or unfair or, or don't treat their worker right. That is a difference, okay? Not in this. In this situation, the Sherman Antitrust is companies that are too big. And so in 1890, this law was passed that says the government is going to keep you from expanding. So basically, Standard Oil was their target. Um, well, they knew they couldn't attack Standard Oil because he had everybody in his hand and palm. So what they do is they went after other companies to try it out. 
For instance, the United States versus the Knight Company, a sugar trust. Guess what? The government went after, I think, seven or eight companies and lost every one of these cases. It wasn't until a little bit later, close to 10 to 12 years later, I'm sorry, the year is 1914, probably, yeah, 1914, that's my math and my memory says, that this Sherman Antitrust Act began to finally breaking up um, the Rockefeller land hold, the, the oil hold that he had, and eventually broke it up into, I believe, 11 different companies. So we know them today as Arco, Atlantic, Richfield, um, I don't know all the names right now, but some of them have disappeared. Uh, one of them was like O'Sullivan's or Sinclair's and it has a dinosaur on it. You'll see it some old cartoons or old commercials and stuff. But yeah, this Sherman Antitrust had baby teeth at the beginning, but by the time the population ideas changed and by the time the government became more sophisticated to handle this and lawyers began to engage, we then begin to see it getting real teeth later on by the 1940s, okay? Um, we do see the growth of corporations. That was the negative aspect of it, but we do see some positive aspect of it where we see Sears Roebuck, which just went belly up literally about five to six years ago, was on the cutting edge of how to get things. This was the Amazon of the day. You can order anything you wanted out of this book and know what the prices were and what it would cost to ship it to you. An incredible marketing strategy because at this point, you didn't know what it would cost and where and how it would arrive when you just go order at the local store and hope it shows up type of thing. So a brilliant marketing strategy that came about during this time of incredible um, business strategies uh, taking place. So I'd like to close on uh, again reminding you, um, America built like on the backs of the Donatos of the world that they might not know how to read, they might not know how to write, but they have created business practices and models and inventions and new strategies and techniques that catapults America to be on the cusp of greatness. We're not quite there of becoming that world power. That doesn't happen until 1901, but we're just about there when we get to 1898. So thanks for being with me. Uh, keep it classy, Golden Bears, and have a good rest of the day.